Action. Welcome back to another episode of Written and Directed By. Today I am joined by Michael Mark Friedman. He is a he is the writer, producer, and star of Kensington and has written for shows such as Dirty Cop, has been in The Superman, and uh, other shows such as NCIS, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. And one I was really excited to see on your list was The Unit. Cause oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I watched that show years ago with my friends, and I, I haven't seen that show or heard that show mentioned in years yeah and then i saw it i was like it's it's crazy (laughs) yeah just to just to clarify i i didn't write on those shows the 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 first couple dirty cops the superman Mm -hmm. and kensington i wrote yeah but the unit yeah you were just in that one yeah i just was acting in them it's funny we were talking last night me and my girlfriend were hanging out we were talking about uh um uh dennis haysbert who was actually, if you remember him, he was in uh, Heat. It mm-hmm. was one of his first movies that he ever did. He played the chef that later on got brought in to uh, to, to, to be part of the, the crew and or to help them out. And he has been doing Allstate. We were figuring it out because he's still doing Allstate. When he did the unit, great guy, by the way. Um, uh, oddly enough, didn't, didn't, didn't know his, his lines, which was bizarre throughout this episode. But, but he... he he was coming from doing an Allstate commercial the day we shot, and that was in 2007. So it's now, so that's 12 years ago. And he had already been doing. I think he's been doing Allstate for like 20 years, which is amazing. Yeah, and a shit ton of money. Because I, I remember when I first saw that my show, or friend first showed me the show, I was like, "That's the Allstate guy." And then I didn't like, I had never seen him in anything yeah. other than those commercials. Because 12 years ago, I was like, it must have been like. 12 <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 i'm only 25 so it's, yeah like that's all i've seen him in yeah oh go see heat yeah yeah if you ch- check out i mean first of all heat is you know uh you know michael mann it's i mean it's a great great film it's shot in la in fact we were just back over by dodger stadium we shot all around dodger stadium downtown and um and there's a there's a a, a you know the the North Hollywood bank robbery. Yeah. Do you know the story yeah. about that? Vaguely. The, well, those guys basically, you know, were trying to reenact the movie Heat. When they, when they, <laughs> when those guys got busted, they eventually got killed because they were walking down, you know, in Moore Park in North Hollywood mm-hmm. with like armor gear on and shit like that. But they, they, when they, when they got into their house, they had VHS tapes of Heat, like seven or eight laying around. And I don't know why you need seven or eight VHS tapes of Heat. I don't know why one doesn't get the trick done. But maybe they were wearing them out from watching them so much. But that's that was their inspiration for the the, the basically mass murder and bank oh, robberies that they committed. And that was back in, uh, well, it had to be after Heat. So it was probably at the, in the late 90s, early 2000s. But uh uh, but yeah, they were copycatters. But yeah, that, that was that's a, crazy. Crazy move. But Haysburg was in that. Yeah, he was in that. I have to look that. I I, I got to look up that story too. That's, yeah, yeah, that's pretty wild. <laughs> um, so how how did you get into acting? Was it something that you always wanted to? Growing up, was it something that you you knew you always wanted to to do, or was it something that you kind of stumbled upon? Yeah, no, I didn't stumble upon it. I didn't stumble upon it. I grew up in uh, I, I grew up in North Philadelphia, Northeast Philadelphia, and um, uh, it wasn't something that you could stumble upon. My dad was a carpenter. My mom was a nursery school mm. teacher, and um, I was uh, you know from a very young age I was a class clown. You know, okay. I, I was I was a goofball, and I was fortunate in that the teachers liked me because I was able to uh, you know I was able to get good grades in class, but. I like from I mean from first to third grade because I used to get the shit kicked out of me when I was a kid. This is true. When when I was in grade school, I was a tiny guy, and I used to talk about it when I did stand up for a while. But I had a huge head, and I was like this little guy with a big head. And growing up in the Northeast at that time, kids would recognize, wow, not only does that guy have a huge head, but he doesn't look like he wants to fight right now. Let's beat the shit out of him, you know. And that yeah. was kind of the deal. But for me. M- Making jokes, being a clown in class gave me, you know, an hour, two hours of sanctuary right. where they weren't going to kick the shit out of me. And then the second I would leave school and leave, 
you know, the classroom and I didn't have jokes to fall back on, that's when they would beat up on me pretty bad. It was crazy. It was crazy. My parents, thank God, they sent me to a high school that not only, uh, meaning they got me out of the neighborhood I was in, they sent me down to North Philly, Mm -hmm. which is kind of the inspiration for Kensington because I had to travel through Kensington every day to get to my high school. Um, Because... A lot of Jesuit schools, but a lot of older schools that are 100, 150 years old, they're like little enclaves. They're in these seedy areas, but they're really yeah. great schools. All over San Francisco has Ignatius and different schools, but it saved my life. It saved my life going out of high school. I'm still close friends with a lot of the guys, and I did my first stand-up when I was in high school. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I'm about to do mine. In, uh, are you really? Yeah, at the end of April, yeah. Yeah, it's tricky out in L.A. because... Uh, in New York and in Philadelphia, but especially in New York, when you do stand up, you can perform 25 times a week. Mm-hmm. And in order to become a good stand up, you have to perform 25 times a week, or at, at minimum 10 times a week. Yeah. And I know that sounds crazy, but like doing the open mic here and there once or twice or three times a week, it just doesn't get it done. I mean, it'll give you a taste of, of what it's like, and you can kind of decide if you like it or not, but you really don't get your feet wet until you get up on stage 50, 60 times. Right. And in New York, it's just amazing, man. I, I, I was proofreading at the time, and I would work midnight to 8 in the morning, and I would get done work at 8. I actually worked in the World Trade Center. I was a legal proofreader. Oh, wow. And I would go home, and I would, if I could, I would try to sleep at like 11, 12 and sleep until, you know, maybe three, four o'clock mm. in the afternoon, get up and uh, go eat something and then go do stand up for three, four hours, five hours until I had to work again wow. at midnight. And, you know, Hamburger Harry's was a crazy place that Jim Gaffigan still probably performs there. I mean, he performed there. This was back 15 years ago when he had already sort of made it. But uh, I was a cedar at the comic strip live in New York, so that gave me access to a lot of uh, great comedians, and uh, and my first performing, you know. But my first actual stand up experience was at Pips. I was like twenty years old, and uh, I fucking bombed terribly in front of uh, my girlfriend and her parents. Oh, it was horrible. <laughs> I had like a makeshift set prepared, and I had some ideas of what I wanted to say. And then something happened when I hit the stage and I saw her parents in the audience and everything just came. It was like I was speaking a different language, man. Nothing was <laughs> funny. It was horrible. I, I, oh, it was a terrible experience. And, but I got up again and uh, I just was fortunate to see the best comics in the world bomb. Right. I was fortunate to see, I, I, you know, I saw Chris Rock perform after 9-11 and he, this was a guy that I sort of revered as a stand-up. Mm-hmm. I just thought he was an amazing stand-up. wasn't great on Saturday Night Live, but I just thought he was a really good stand-up. And I was fortunate enough to see him right after 9-11. I mean, I'm talking like three, four days after 9-11. Wow. He, was, he was preparing for Carnegie. He was going to do a set at Carnegie with Seinfeld and a couple other guys for a benefit. And he was, he was doing his prep at, at the comic strip. And he was saying stuff like, well, I understand why this happened because... Because, you know, it was our fault. You know, he was saying shit like, yeah, the reason why they, they bombed us is because it was our, f-, you know, saying just this provocative, subversive shit. And people were looking at him. I mean, he had like three minutes where everybody was on his side. And then he started saying that and people were looking at him like they wanted to fucking kill him. But he didn't give a shit. And the thing about watching him perform was you never saw that dude sweat at all. It, it, you couldn't tell the difference. You 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 couldn't notice whether he was bombing or or mm. or or doing amazingly well. Right. And it was a huge lesson for me because I realized, like, yeah, being self-deprecating is great. Meaning you can say, you know, make fun of yourself and be vulnerable and all that stuff. But having confidence in who you are on stage and having confidence like I don't give a shit if this audience because in his mind he was like these are 50 people this is not my this is this is one speck right. of the people that are actually going to see my and they don't determine whether I'm funny or not right and that's just something to always hold on to. I mean I know you said you're about to do your first stand up but that's something to always hold on to is that you know it's 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 a process and uh uh doesn't matter what they think 
Yeah. And you're going to fucking bomb, you know, you're going to bomb. But that was, <laughs> yeah, but yes, like the thing but, I'm but afraid of. <laughs> a long answer to your, your or a short answer in a, in a very long way is that, uh, uh, I knew from a very young age mm-hmm. that that's what I wanted to do. I, I didn't know how I was going to do it. Yeah. I didn't know how I was going to go about it. I know how I was going to get to New York and do all the things that I've done, but mm-hmm. I knew that's what I wanted to do. Just perform in general. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Is, um, is there, was there always like a, an end goal or like other than just performing and, and being like taking your goofiness to the next level? Was there like, oh, I want to be in like a Scorsese movie? Or did you kind of have thoughts like that or like? No, I, w- I always gravitated to uh, authenticity, mm-hmm. telling the truth. Uh, I was always a storyteller. I was never, you know, my stand up was okay, but it, I wasn't a joke writer. So I wasn't able to, you know, I would always, uh, it's not that I marveled at joke writers, but I, I you know, I was always, uh, you know, there were, it was always amazing to me, the guys who could, like the Stephen Wrights of the world, who could just yeah. flat out fucking write jokes, you know. I, I, that wasn't me. I told long stories, and I was able to find jokes in the stories, but I, I was just a, a, a storyteller. And what happened was, um, you know, when I, when I moved out, to Los Angeles, um, you know, well, let me take it back a step. When I was in New York, mm-hmm. I was I, I, w- I was doing stand up and I was breaking into clubs and I got managed by one of the club owners um, that owned stand up New York. This guy, Carrie Hoffman. And what was great about that is that he was putting me on stage three, four times a night at his own clubs. So I was able to get a ton of stage time and okay. it was a great experience. Yeah. You know, I would get not long, but 15 minute sets and. And but I started to do the road a little bit, and I didn't like it. I got depressed on the road. I I didn't feel comfortable. I I, I just uh, it just wasn't for me. I just felt. Re- I mean, if if I'm being completely candid, I just felt lonely. And and uh, I, I I did a like a th- couple three month stretch stretches there, and mm-hmm. it just didn't work for me. So I I um I moved out. I I had an opportunity. I was up. Uh, you know, for for uh, a, a role out here, and I and and I came out to audition for it, and then I was up for it, a, a role in the office actually as a as a construction worker, and uh, I decided that I was going to move out here, and um, and after I didn't when I didn't get the part, my manager at the time said, "Why don't you come back to New York, man? You're not going to stay out there. Just come back to New York and 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 and." continue to do stand up but I don't like to do something and not do it full mm-hmm. full, full full blown and right. and uh so I I uh I stayed out here um and did stand up for a little bit but um did not enjoy doing stand up out in LA it just was a different animal for me and uh I produced a couple shows at El Cid and some different places but uh I just couldn't get the stage time that I did there it was more out out in LA, I found this is my experience that it's more about your TV credits, mm. as far as getting stage time at the Laugh Factory in these different places. And now I can only imagine that it's about how many followers you have on Instagram and all this yeah. stuff. And and for me, um, I just it, I I just didn't feel comfortable. I felt like um, uh, that a lot of the comics were more fucked up than me. And what I mean by that is that they just didn't. Yeah, I'm kind of an easygoing guy, man. I don't care. I, I'm not competitive. I don't care if if you're funny. That's fantastic. If you're a nice person, that's even better. And so for me, that was it. And I just didn't feel that reciprocated. So gotcha. I I just uh, I you know around uh, I guess I was out here two years around 2005 2006. I just realized that uh, I was more of a storyteller and that I was going to start writing and shooting my own stuff. And uh, and that's what I did. Awesome. Yeah. So what? So after deciding that, where did that like that take you? Like, did, um, when you wrote your first story, and did you pitch it to anyone, or was it just I'm gonna make it myself, create it with my friends, sort of thing? Or were you? Did you already have like a? Since you had a manager, was it was it like? Can you take me take this somewhere for me to get it made, or like how did you go about that? Like breaking into TV or film? Well, the, 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 so. I mean, the first thing is this. Breaking into TV and film is an interesting idea. Mm-hmm. And it's funny that you mention it like that. It's, it's, I have my own, you know, obviously I've been doing this for, for 
20 plus years mm. and I, and I have my own, um, sort of, you know, thinking about these things. And that is, I, you know, I never did this to become famous. I never did this to, uh, I did that. I'm a storyteller. Yeah. And I came from kind of a, a lower middle class section of Philadelphia, and I and I had stories to tell. Yeah. I mean, you can imagine. I mean, I got my fucking head kicked in for the first fifteen years of my life, so I was a sensitive young kid who felt like I was wearing the weight of the world on my shoulders. Gotcha. And because of that, I I you know, and and it's funny. You look at me and hear me now, and you're like, this dude got his <laughs> head kicked in. That's fucking crazy. But but. Uh, but I, I, I literally was four foot two with this head and I, I didn't grow until I was in high school. And it doesn't matter how big you get. I mean, it doesn't matter what you look like, sound like. It doesn't matter. It's, it matters what's inside. And, and, and I was a very sensitive kid and a very, I'm a very sensitive adult. And the reality is, is that the beauty of that was that I saw a lot mm -hmm. and I recorded a lot and I, and I observed a lot and I took in a lot and... I carry a pen and pa paper with me everywhere I go, and I recommend that to everybody because, or a dictaphone, or now you have your 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 your. I, I like writing it down, yeah. But now, you, you can, rather than typing it in my phone, but if you can and you can hit record and record yourself, and that works better for you than use that. But write down everything because the detail always withers away. Right. The more time you 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 take away from actually writing a pen to paper or or actually recording it, the detail goes away. Yeah. And the detail is everything. And I just I just try to do that as often as I can and and I try to write every day. That's awesome. And the first thing that I wrote was almost everything that I write is 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 somehow influenced or loosely based on aspects of of my life. So, you know, the Superman was the first thing that I wrote and it was about an aspiring boxer who takes a job as a building super for free rent. Okay. And it's a, it's it's works out well for him except that he's got to deal with his crazy tenants. And that was that was the first thing. That was that was about 13 years ago, 14 years ago, and um and we shot in my building. I was an apartment manager in the place that I live now and uh I took a lot of stories that from in and around the building, and we shot in the units. And uh, at first, I shot a pilot mm -hmm. um, that we shot for three to five hundred bucks, something like that. And we sent it to a festival, and it was well received at the festival. And then we got a manager that was interested in it, different manager than the one back gotcha. at Santa Monica. Okay. But we got a manager that was interested in it. And he ended up giving us money to shoot more episodes. So we shot more episodes. And then we won a big festival out here at the time. It was called the ITV Festival. And a long story short, we ended up working with a couple production companies until we ultimately, and I'm, I'm cutting it short, but yeah. we ultimately got it to um, Rob McElhaney and the creators of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Oh, wow. okay. And those guys liked it but and and but they weren't sure how they would sell it but specifically they 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 liked me and enough that they championed me in one of their projects and got me a series regular role with no representation so i had no representation wow. at the time and they got me a series regular role in one of their pilots for fox this was about six uh f six years ago and uh and it was great. It was great. It was one of the greatest experiences of my life. I mean, I, I literally, you know, and that's why I tell everybody who worries about having an age and a representation mm -hmm. that in the, in the, in, in the climate that we have now where you can create your own stuff and create vehicles for yourself, that it's just, it's just, it's, it, there's, there's no excuses waiting around for an agent to send you out or to get work, uh, through a manager to get auditions uh, that uh, it's great if they come in, that's fantastic. And, and if you get representation, but they can't do anything for you that you can't do for yourself. Right. And the reality is, is that they're not going to do anything for you until you do something for yourself. If you're sitting there with a headshot, unless you're 21 years old and you look like Brad Pitt, if you're sitting there with a headshot, expecting someone to say, Oh God, I, I hope they see my heart and my potential. Yeah through this headshot and my experience when I, that I went to William Esper Studios in New York, 
that it, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Because there's too many young men and women and, and, and older men and women that are out there creating their own vehicles and creating their own stuff and doing what's in their control every day that are going way beyond. And there's no excuse. Even if you sit at home and you say, I'm not a writer or I'm not a director or I'm not a filmmaker, what I say to that or that I'm just an actor and that's who I am, I'm an actor, what I say to that is that's fantastic that you're just an actor. What parts do you want to play? What roles did you want to do? You know, think about the parts that you want to play. Think and 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 in this town where writers, I could I could trip over a writer as I walk out of your complex. Right. <laughs> go find a writer. Go on Craigslist. I could tell you crazy stories about finding DPs, finding directors, how I found directors to work with. You know, I like to direct my own stuff, but I'm in most of my stuff, right. so it's a little bit challenging yeah. for me. So I work with uh, the guy that directed. Uh, Kensington, um, this this latest project that's going to be actually in the Beverly Hills Film Festival oh, awesome. this weekend, I mean, Saturday. Congratulations! That's yeah, awesome. um, Matt Ferrucci is his name. He directed me in the last project that he actually wrote, and we just remained friends. And you know, he's a super smart guy, and and uh, and we work well together. So we've we've kept in touch. But there's just no, there's just, but he, you know, he met me through something else that right. he saw me in. You know, and the trick is, is just every day to wake up and work on something that is in your control. Yeah. The, the, I think the, the most advice I get from people that are in the industry is because everyone has taken their own path that like, there's no two guys that are in the same position that have the same yeah. path. So the advice that I I'm always given is create your own, um, opportunities is, is that like you're saying, like no one's going to do it for you. Yeah. So like I, I wrote my first script, my first feature. I mean, I've done shorts, but you know, I can, there's only so many days I can sit in my room being like, oh, when is it going to be my turn? And I'm just staring at a blank screen. So I like, it's, it's nice to hear that. Like to, when you hear that, like, Oh, I, I, I wrote my thing. I just met people and I made it like, that's, it's very inspiring to hear that as well. Like as someone who was starting in someone, something different, I like doing comedy and then coming to, to film yeah like that's cool that, that's that's pretty cool to me to to hear that because i don't know so I, i'm a young guy so i feel like yeah I'm like waiting for that opportunity but like I, I hear i can make my opportunity come whenever i want it to whether it's received now or later it's just i have to be the one that ultimately that does it yeah it's the only thing that's going to keep you sane yeah that's and funny you say you're a young guy are yeah. you are you intimating that i'm an old guy no no no, 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 no. no. i'm joking i'm joking i'm joking that's but a yes. joke i am an old guy i'm 20 <laughs> years older than you but 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 to what you, to, to your point um yeah it's it's a, it's a, it's about keeping sanity too yeah. it's about keeping sanity like i moved out here i i you know and it goes it goes quick like i started doing stand up when i was 20 years old and I, I, I joined SAG when I was 27 and, you know, I, I, I've been fortunate that I've been able to make a living out here mm -hmm. at some years doing what I love yeah. and other years doing other stuff. And I've always kept the apartment manager job because I wanted free rent. I didn't want to ever have to deal with having to pay my rent yeah. or worry about my rent. But, but, and in, 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 on the way, while I was doing that, I was able to get stories and obviously write a show yeah, about it. That's a, I mean, that's a great place to get stories. Yeah, I, I mean, typically that's that's that that's, you know, where my stories come from. It, it's it's uh, this one, this one Kensington's a little bit different. It's it's about it. It was more of an idea that came from, um, a couple different experiences, but. But uh, I've been going to therapy since I was 15 years old. It's about a it's about a fish out of water therapist. Okay that um that that moves into a rough section of philadelphia and we could talk about that in a little bit but 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 to your to your point it's 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 just this you know as a 25 year old man the thing to know is that's great that you just wrote a feature mm -hmm. but you didn't write that feature so it can just sit there right and so what i would what i you know what i would encourage you to do is to continue to write and continue to write and then find ways to shoot that stuff yeah and you don't have to raise a lot of money to shoot. Steve Soderbergh just just shots. I mean, everybody's shooting on the yeah, iPhone. Yeah, and that's not expensive. And it's like if your project, you know, it's it's funny. I was just reading a buddy's uh, uh, project, and you know, there was a 
a huge car chase scene and there was like a bunch of and 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 I, and, and I have a friend who just wrote a, a a short that takes place in a certain location and it's like at the end of the day you know shoot it on spec you know shoot it shoot it as a sizzle mm-hmm. shoot it just just shoot because the experience of shooting and getting actors together yeah. and getting writers together and there's no better experience and that's yeah. why we do this yeah so we can actually work we don't do this so we can take fucking pitch meetings <laughs> right you know because pitch meetings i'd rather literally stab myself in the eye with a fucking pencil <laughs> than 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 take a pitch meeting you know it's just there's nothing i mean don't get me wrong if pitch people in this town give great meetings yeah you know you can go have some of the best meetings in this town. You'll, you, I mean, it's unbelievable. You walk out feeling like a million dollars, but at the end of the day, that's not why we do this. So we can feel like a million dollars walking out of a meeting. Right. You know, it's 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 about you know getting our stuff. I'm telling you, man. Until the day you die, you can create your own stuff and you can have it screened. Yeah. You know, and that's and that and that's you know part two to what we're saying. These festivals, like I I don't get me wrong. Every, there's not a per, I, I'd be crazy if I didn't say I wanted to sell stuff and I wanted to get stuff in hands that can get, that, that can ultimately get my stuff on TV and all yeah. of that stuff. That's that that's important. But at the end of the day, the first reason I do it is to tell stories. The second reason I do it is to create those stories and to have them seen on the big screen. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the, that's that's the reason why I do it. Yeah. Because so. originally, like that's and that's the same reason I'm in it as well. Because I originally went to school for illustration and animation. I wanted to kind of be like Seth MacFarlane, you know, that aspect, yeah. uh, do voices and whatnot. But I was just all about storytelling. I wrote my own comics, um, self, you know, drew them all, wrote stories. And then I have just found one day I was watching a movie and I was like, I don't know what it is, what it takes to do that, but that's how I want to tell stories now. And that's kind of how I fell into it and I just I didn't think anything about it like I didn't know like what it took I just knew I wanted to do it and I just knew it would take my storytelling to the next level and that's all I'm I want to do about it do with it as well so I've I mean yes of course it would be amazing to have an Oscar or to be nominated for all these things but um it's not really why I do it yeah yeah you went to school for for directing um, yeah, I went for, I wound up switching majors, going to school for filmmaking, um, cause I knew nothing about it. I used to shoot movies in the backyard using my MacBook. We'd use, point the camera, you know, like, yeah, yeah, I didn't yeah. have anything else to do it. All I had was the, the little, you know, the photo booth with the, and we would just video that yeah. way. You grew up in this neighborhood? I grew up in, uh, in Scottsdale. Okay. Arizona. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. So has there been, do you have like a, uh, a favorite onset experience like that's something that's mind-blowing or not mind-blowing but like mate i feel like we all have stories that that are like that you just want to tell someone that it happens on set is there something that's like very memorable to you uh something that's yeah i mean i gotta Sorry, it's, i'm all over the place no, <laughs> no 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 that's okay um well well, during the shooting of the Superman, we had a woman die on set. That was that was that was crazy. Yeah, we we uh, one of my tenants, she had a brain aneurysm and died. That was that was a fucking picnic, to having that happen. That was the craziest thing that's ever happened. But but uh, yeah, we were just we were out shooting on the on the on the sidewalk and and uh, oh um, and one of the tenants came running out to grab us and we we went and. Uh, went in and she was this woman was laying on the floor and she just was crazy but uh but that wasn't a fun experience that was a cra- that was that was just that was quite quite a uh a distraction from the uh but i mean that was the crazy thing about that film it or that that series was that you know i was trying to shoot in the complex and i was also the building manager right. at the same time so it was kind of crazy were you using were you using um your tenants as actors in the show or? we did a couple of them okay. we did this guy victor we did we just had him come out real quick and wave to one of the tenants but we, most of them were actors gotcha they, okay yeah but 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 we did use a couple of them and oddly enough um little odd fact well john polito was in it if you don't know john polito he just recently passed uh his boyfriend was in it as well daryl armbruster but john polito was in miller's crossing 
Amazing, okay. and, and you can for for your listeners, you can find the Superman at uh, at, at on ScrappleTown dot com. Uh, but John Polito is fantastic. This is another little interesting tidbit, and I'll give you a couple stories mm-hmm. in a second. But so John Polito and Larry Hankin. Larry Hankin was just in Barry. Okay. Actually, he was the the Russian guy who 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 doesn't talk that much oh, that right. they bring in to or kill the guy. and then yeah, he yeah. shoots himself in the yeah. head. <laughs> That's Larry Hankin. Okay. He was in he was in the Superman. He was in Breaking Bad. He's done a ton of shit. Um a ton of stuff. Armed and Dangerous. He's 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 done a bunch of stuff. A lot in the 80s and uh he was like an original orig, one of the original members of that improv group out of San Francisco that I cannot think of right now. But not the Groundlings, but a different one, and I can't think of their name right now. But anyway, uh, but the amazing thing about those two guys is that they would show up to set, and this is a lesson for all the young actors and young anything. They would show up to set. John Polito showed up to set with five different wardrobe changes. This guy could have showed up in whatever the fuck he wanted, and I would have been cool with it because it's John Polito, and he was in Miller's Crossing, and every every. Uh, Coen Brothers film. He right. was an amazing <laughs> Barton Fink. He, just an amazing actor. And Larry Hankin showed up in wardrobe. He showed up in a bathrobe. Like, showed up in a bathrobe, like, roaming around the outside. They showed up a half hour early. They showed up with all their lines memorized. They showed up with ideas, questions, suggestions, everything. Wow. They were prepared. And that is the reason why those guys worked. That is... The reason to be an actor is to show up prepared. That's a bit, that's, that's, uh, you know, and I, I'm a little older, so I can give these lessons, but that is the one thing I will say to any actor, writer, director, anybody out there, focus on what is right in front of your fucking eyes. Yeah. If you decide, hey, I'm going to work on this, I'm committed to this, then do it. Don't be thinking about all the jobs that you're not getting. Don't be thinking about all the auditions that you're not getting. Focus on what's in front of you. All actors, that's what they do. They, they, they have a job that they don't even realize right in front of their face, and they're thinking about the next thing or they're thinking about the thing that they didn't get instead of the job that they already committed to that's right in front of their face. And you look at guys like John Polito and Larry Hank, and those guys were the ultimate professionals, you know, and they, they uh, you know, they just, they, 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 just a great, great example for 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 young actors, but um, but Hankin and uh, yeah, Hankin and Polito were amazing. We had there was, there was it was just a that that whole shoot was just an amazing experience. But 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 with that shoot, it's funny you talk about experience. Like I remember they asked us during a panel discussion, like what was the biggest challenge we faced, and for that at that time, and and again, it was just. It was just the fear and thinking that I could actually get it accomplished. Mm. We had twenty five actors, and you know, I, it was it was my first thing, and just I, I remember just feeling overwhelmed that yeah. like there's. But then once we accomplished that, I it was I was unstoppable after that. Meaning yeah. I wasn't scared to do anything. We could have had a hundred guys on set, and it wasn't going to be a problem. But it's and same with stand up. Stand up is the same thing. You got to do it. Right. You got to do it, and you got to do it a lot, and you got to bomb a lot. And it's not until you bomb a lot and do it a lot and fail miserably that you start to realize, I either hate this or I love it. and Or you hate it and you know you're going to love it someday once you get better at it. It doesn't matter. But the reality is you got to do it. Right. Right, right. You can't sit around talking about it. That's one of the biggest, you know, it's one of my biggest pet peeves is when guys sit around talking about stuff that they're going to do and never do it. You know, it drives me nuts. You know, I feel like growing up in in Philadelphia, the neighborhoods that I grew in, grew up in, you know, where people lived and died on the same block and they never stepped outside of a three mile radius. It was a lot of guys just talking about dreams, talking about things that they should have done, could have done, would have done. And they never did. Yeah. You know, and uh, and those stories are a dime a dozen in those areas. And you just got to You just got to do it. And you got to focus on what's in front of you and you got to stay positive and 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 not worry about what's not in your fucking control right then. Yeah. Uh, but as far as one of the coolest things that ever happened to me, actually, um, this is as an actor, was um, I did an episode of NCIS, which which is my mom and dad's <laughs> favorite thing that I ever did. They didn't really love Dirty Cop. I don't know if you watched any of Dirty no. Cops. Watched, yeah. 
Um, but uh, what, you have me on? You don't watch any I'm of my so, shit? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. That's amazing. You would dig Dirty Cops, man. You would dig it. You I, dig the soup? You didn't watch the Superman either? No, I haven't. I'm sorry. I'm oh, terrible. my I'm terrible Lord. host. <laughs> That's funny. Um, guy goes and finds a 20 year old headshot of me, but he can't <laughs> sit down and watch. Uh, and that, dude, Fuck. podcast 101, man. Yeah. You got to watch a little stuff. I know. Stuff. I, know. I, 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 I didn't do enough prep. I'm, I apologize. <laughs> not, not enough. Some. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's uh anyway, it's I'm not gonna I'm not, I already did, but I'm not gonna continue to uh bray for that. That's cool. He, he will have when we when we cut. <laughs> yeah. Um but when I when I when I did the episode of MCIS, uh um Mark Harmon, like like another guy, consummate professional, one mm-hmm. of the nicest guys I've ever met. I mean the kind of guy like you would sit down at lunch and you would eat and then he would go try to bust your tray and you're i would turn you know i turned to him i said no 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 you don't have to and all the other actors were like no that's what mark does and that's who he is and he was just the just the sweetest nice all of our scenes were together and after every take he would you know ask me both of our fathers were in the military so he would Mm -hmm. ask about my father and and when I was uh, leaving the last day of shooting, he invited me back to his trailer and he said, hey, come here for a second. I got something for you. And he had a hat, an NCIS hat that he gave me and he autographed oh, wow. for him. And the day that the episode aired, there was a message on my machine, on my voicemail, and it was from an unknown number. And he, um, I didn't know who it was from. It said unknown, so I didn't I didn't even think to listen to it until later on in the day, and then I listened to it, and it was like a minute message from him. Oh, wow. And he, I mean, such, just just such a, a, a generous, humble human being. He said, uh, he said, hey, Mike, uh, sorry I didn't call last night, which is absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> uh, but he was like, sorry I didn't call last night after the episode. He's like, I just wanted to call. And I said, and he just said all these nice things. And he said, I'm sure you made your father proud. You were a Marine out there. And he just, he, he it just was it just was amazing and, and then he left his phone number he said if you have any questions you can call me at blah 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 and gave his number and and uh and i ended up i ended up calling him back and just leaving a message and then i wrote him a letter and just a, just a, one of my favorite experience ever working on a show i mean i haven't had you know a ton of experience but out of out of out of the guest star spots that i've had that was the best experience that i've ever had and uh just a you know, mo- most of most of mo- for for the first ten years that I was in New York, and then first ten years mm-hmm. out here, most of the stuff that I did was voiceover and commercial work. Gotcha. You know, while I was while I was, uh, you know, writing and shooting my own stuff. Yeah. It's, it's, it's been, well since the unit was two thousand seven. That was my first guest star, and then always sunny, and then from there. But but yeah, that was that they, 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 they. I mean, I don't have it. I mean, I'm sure I have nutty stories, but they're kind of negative stories that yeah. don't really. I, not, none that I want to rehash, but I, <laughs> I've had a couple of horror stories, but but uh, but yeah, that's 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 kind of it. Yeah, uh, yeah. I was I was thinking about because most of my stories, my because my first big project outside of you know just short films with friends was um, I directed a western film out in Tucson, and just the the guy that we wound up hiring for to handle all the guns and life the blank firing guns to just turned out to be a, a nightmare of a person so, so I was like i was trying to think of like funny like what what are some good fun experiences like that's and that's the only one that comes up because that's the the heaviest experience that was there because my lead was black he showed up with a you know a union jack flag in his back pocket oh wow he's a racist yeah. so yeah he was in my my producer was female so he yeah did you know it just turned out to be a shit show so I'm like, yeah i'm trying to think of good stories but that's the only one that stands out. So we fired him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's. It, oh, I mean, in this, in this, in this business, there's just. Uh, what do they say? They say that, um, you know, there's narcissists all over the country. It just so happens that ninety percent of them live in Los Angeles. You know, and that's what you. You know that, that that's that's you know that's what you're dealing with. That's why if you're like a a good person with a kind soul. Mm-hmm. 
you have to, I mean, I know I keep harping it, but you have to figure yeah. out a way to work on what's in your control, you know, yeah. because if you, if you expend energy depending on other people or depending on this business to, to reward you, you're, 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 I, I think the people that have success in this business are the people that have a clear path to exactly what they want to do. And they have a clear path to how and, and why they want to find their own voice. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's the key. The key is finding your voice, not what, not the movie that that fucking guy made or that guy made or this guy made or the, the, the TV show that that person's doing, finding your voice, the stories that you want to tell. If somebody asks me, what, what stories do I want to tell? I want to tell blue collar working class stories. You know, that's, that's what I like to talk about. And I think that's the key. I think it's, it's about, it's about finding your voice. And the beauty of that is, is that you have, you know, you're 25 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, you can do that for the rest of your life. Right. You know, and if you can get your mind away from, look, I'm not saying, look, if you have an agent or you have representation, fantastic. You know, get them over your scripts, get them over. But instead of getting it over to them and then sitting around and like, oh my God, you know, UTA has my script now and I have this representation and that's fantastic and I'm going to sit around, I'm going to wait for them because now that they have it, I know that they're going to do. No, no. Give them the script. That's great. There's your representation. Take the script and now get back to work. Now get back to work. Learn how to direct. Learn how to act. Mm -hmm. Take an acting class. Learn every different aspect of the business. Right. The best you, that you can. You know, and that will make you excel in ways that your that, that, that your friends, your colleagues, other people aren't doing. That's yeah. the key. Gotcha. And that's the key to sanity. Yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I get antsy when I don't have a project to work on. So yeah. I'm always trying to come up with something else. Like I have friends that like, yeah, let's make projects. And we'll sit and brainstorm about it. But that's sometimes that's as far as it gets. And I sit here just kind of like, what the fuck? Why not? Why aren't we? You know, like, well, we'll wait till we get some money to do this. And you're like, what? what why? Why would we wait? Because I like this script that I wrote. I want to shoot it right now. Like, I mean, obviously, I don't want to shoot it on the second draft, but like, I want to in the next couple months. I, like, I would like to be able to start doing it. And I know well, what's what what what, what, what? what? How about taking a first step? Why not have a table read? Why not get yeah. some actors together? And you don't promise the actors anything, right? I mean, I have two scripts. I have two pilots now. You know, we have this, <coughs> we have this screening on Saturday. But God bless you. I I have these two pilots that we're doing a reading of on Thursday, and. <clears throat> I'm doing it literally. They're not finished products. They're not, they're not, they're definitely not ready to go. Right. But I want to see them. I want to hear them. I want to, I want to, you know, and I want to get moving on. And what happens is when you do something like that, get a reading together, mm -hmm. then you start thinking about people. You start thinking about characters. You start right. seeing the, it's just, a, it's just the next step. And it's a way to a actually really develop a script, really develop it. Yeah. Not like they do here, where it, the development season is not a development season. It's just about finding scripts that you want to shoot. Right. That's a development season here. Well, especially in TV, you know. Yeah. the 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 process of 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 you know pilot season here and the way it works. I mean, we're talking TV now. We're not talking with mm -hmm. film, but is is archaic. Yeah. It's, I don't know TV. Like I, I've never really yeah. had any, made much of an interest in TV, so I don't really know that. Yeah. any of that side so yeah. like all I hear is from like friends that have done it when, but um, yeah they don't say it's very I haven't heard very positive things about pilot like that it's not it's like a lot of chaos for them or it can be yeah well I don't know about that I, you know I don't know how much it's just a lot of money spent um, without much preparation You're, and with expecting miracles mm -hmm. You're expecting miracles. I mean, you 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 literally have a, a a development season into pilot season, and the development season consists of literally picking the scripts, and you make a couple changes to the script, and then you have pilot season where you in in a matter of weeks, you cast out of the scripts that mm -hmm. were chosen, you cast the scripts, and you have them meet each other for the first time at a table read, and then they sit down, and, and then the next week you start shooting. And you put two million, three million dollars into Jeez. that, and expect miracles to happen. That's crazy. That's to me. That's crazy. It as a guy, crazy. as a as a guy who takes five to ten thousand mm -hmm. dollars to shoot my scripts, and I do table reads. We do workshopping. We do table work. We do, we yeah. workshop it like I'm in theater. 
Like, why would that? And, and you're taking three million dollars and, and putting it, investing it into these actors because they have whatever. I don't know. Three million followers. I don't know what they have. They're talented. But you expect these talented actors to get together and all of a sudden they're just to be chemistry like that. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. When there's when there's, you know, to me, that's a that's a different story. So you want to you want to you want to make films. Mm hmm. That's what you want to do. Yeah, I mean, I know you've been but, writing features. Yeah, but you said you made. Some I would shorts. love. Yeah, that's. I mean, at this right now, films is the goal. I mean, I wouldn't mind TV. I don't mind. Like, I I still love and want to do animated things. So you know, on whatever avenue will let me tell a story. Yeah, is what I'm open to. If it's if it's writing a play, you know, then that's what it is. But at the moment, I'm focusing on on film specifically. Yeah. Um, gotcha. But yeah, I mean, yeah, that, I mean, I think probably the, yeah, that's gotta be the next step as a Taylor reader, at least to hear it because I only hear it how I think it's supposed to sound versus how, however someone else might, t you know, like you might think it's supposed to be this way. And then some, someone comes in and then they're like, Oh, it doesn't sound right anymore. And so, right. no, that's, a, I'm, that's, I guess that's the next step <laughs> or one of them. Um, but yeah, I, I would love to, to start working on it because, because I just, like I said, I hate sitting around and just wishing that I could do it. Um, cause that's, I mean, that's a, that's a lot of what I do when I, when I write, I'm like, Oh, how do I get, how do I now go and do this? And I started a production company with, uh, with two of my friends and we're start we're like trying to compile some projects and we're working on a few things, but a lot of it's like, let's kind of wait and see where things go. And I, I'm just sitting back and just like, oh, why can't we just fucking do it right now? Mm. And do some of these things. And a lot of it's, yeah, we, we collectively, we don't have a shitload of money to, yeah. to go out and spend on cameras and whatnot. But I mean, like you said, we have iPhones and I have all this gear to probably pull together something. Yeah. Is it Sennheiser right here? Yeah. That's uh, a good boom mic. Yeah. A couple, couple of audio technicals. Yeah. But, um, I mean, you know, it's so easy now. So it's like, I, I was like, we, we shoot short films all the time, but I would love to get away from, like, not necessarily get away from, but just kind of push the boundaries and, mm -hmm. and do things because my, my Western, it didn't really have a lot of, um, it didn't really get a lot of recognition in film festivals. It hasn't been doing that great. Um, that's a feature. No, it's a short film. It's a 10 minute short actually uh it was did supposed you, to be longer did you send it to film festivals i sent it to a couple yeah um which ones i sent it to there was a few in arizona that were local um i sent it oh, where did i send it? i i sent so i i shot it as a, i was leaving school as my like technically my senior capstone oh, so gotcha. i sent it to um cons as part of the student film and they I don't know. They didn't want it. Um, I forget. Well, that's else, okay. That's, but, a, that's yeah, like that's a massive one. Yeah, but I, was, I sent it as a crapshoot anyway. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was just a lot of smaller, like Western specific ones. A lot of ones that were, because my lead was African American, I sent it to a few that were about, um, that were focused on African American leads and stories. Um, but yeah, I was kind of, I was, a, I was a little surprised but that uh, no one, took it or even considered it so i don't know <laughs> so it's just floating around right now i um haven't released it anywhere yet but yeah i'm not really sure what i'm trying what i want to do with it anymore i don't know if uh how I much wanna... you spend on it what was the budget it was like eighteen thousand, something like that yeah yeah That's was, a, i mean you know, we had we had a we rented out a western town horses guns the a local theater donated some of the costumes. Where'd so. you shoot? Lone Pine? Uh, we shot in uh, Benson, just so like 30 minutes outside of Tucson. Oh, you shot in, in yeah, Arizona. Yeah, in Arizona. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I love what I did. I, th I think it's amazing. Like, it was the best experience yeah. I've ever gotten. The best. That's really I what mean, matters, yeah. Um, I mean, my lead dropped out two days in, so I had to figure out how to now go about it. I had to... You directed? Mm -hmm. yeah. I directed and wrote it. I had to rewrite the whole thing because it was based on this male lead. And right. all I had left was a female who was supposed to be his sister. Right. And because like we only had an X amount of days in this town, I had to like, and all the people were scheduled for certain days. I had to 
figure out, okay, these are the people we have left and this is what we have left now. This is the money we have left. Okay, how do I do it? And so I had a, took a 30 minute, chopped it down to 10 and came up with a new story using all the resources that we still had available. And yeah, I learned so much more in that, in those nine days than I ever did in like the four or five years of schooling that I, that I had. And oh yeah. I would never. Hands on always makes yeah. a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. But you, you know, you gotta, you gotta, uh, you just gotta keep making them, man. Yeah. It's, it, 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 and, and I say that it's th- that thing I've said earlier about finding your voice. I mean, it's a huge thing. I mean, I'm not to quote a dancer, but this is my, my, I, when I went to acting school, I went to the neighborhood playhouse in New York. I went to Fordham, but, and this, um, this woman, Mar Benham quoted her teacher and I'm not going to do it justice, but her, her teacher was Martha Graham. You've okay. heard of Martha? I've Graham? heard of her. Yeah. Yeah. She's a famous modern dance teacher. And, and she basically, you know, like the idea behind it, because I'll, 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 I'll paraphrase, but mm-hmm. it was, you know, you work, you work your whole life in the art that you do to have one moment. And so you work your whole life towards that one moment. And when you do something, the idea is that if you do something and you look at it, like your short film, for instance, mm-hmm. and you look at it and you say, I mean, is this coming in? When I t- yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. If you, if you look at it and you say, this is the best that I can ever do. I'm looking at this right now and this is the best. That Western, I'm looking at it and this mm-hmm. is the best I can ever do. And no one responds to it and no festivals like it. And it, Then maybe it's time to hang it up. Mm-hmm. But until you say, this is the best that I can do, and the, the the idea behind that is is that it's it's really never the you're you're working your whole life to have yeah. that one moment. Like for instance, did you see Free Solo? No, not yet. No. That's oh on my fuck! List. You got to go yeah. see that, dude. It's the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. It looks incredible. Yeah. But like that guy may continue to do other things or whatever. Mm-hmm. But literally, like that. I mean, somebody descri- in, in the film they describe it. They say it's the most. I've seen it twice in the in the theaters. I've never climbed a fucking rock <laughs> in my life, nor would I. Yeah. And maybe that's part of the reason why I was so inspired by it. But but literally, the guy said, one of the other rock climbers, he's like, if you can imagine being in the Olympics, and if you don't win the gold, mm-hmm. you die. Right. Like, if you don't win a gold medal, you die. That's what he was doing. And you got to look at your projects that way. And what I mean is, is like, you know, You worked your ass off, mm-hmm. but is that the best you can ever do? Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> yeah. you I know? mean, at the time, but I mean, yeah, thinking you're, back you're... on it, there was like when I watch it back, I'm like, oh fuck, you know. I just... Yeah, life is about practice, man. Mm-hmm. We practice, 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 practice. That's what this all is. Yeah, life is practice. You know, in everything we do, people forget that. Look at all the talented. NBA basketball players, baseball players, they're talented as shit, but they never go anywhere. They never go anywhere because they don't practice. Tiger Woods, an amazing golfer, got to where he was because he practiced every single day. People people forget that. Yeah. Michael Jordan, same thing. LeBron James, same thing. Mm -hmm. You know? Very rarely do you see people that are just naturally talented and just and just and just happen to just have this amazing career without working on it. Yeah. It doesn't happen. And everything in life is practice, and people forget about that. People think in practice in terms of sports, but then other things like filmmaking <clears throat> and like writing and all this other stuff, they don't think of the same thing. It's all practice. Yeah, you know. I th- yeah, I think that's because I've I've fallen into that like where it's like oh it's filmmaking you know how often do you need to quote unquote practice being like but as i think as i've made more and more things i've seen like how how like i one shot like you, you know because we'll use the same shots over and over and yeah. it's like so you'll see how like the framing on one is like compared to something you did a month or you know, a year ago you're like holy shit like it just looks nicer the, yeah. the way like the composition is and you realize like the more you do it the more just how how better you get at framing up a face or something you know yeah it's just something so simple and, and it's when i realized that i'm like oh like by doing these once a week or however often or like just even studying up on watching just watching films and watching how these other directors will 
just a simple something like a, putting a, a a glass on like on a table. That's right. And it's like it's crazy how much you can learn, and then when you repetitively do it, it's like I at least I realized how how much it affected me and like compared to my Western and like to the one minute short I just made, like the stuff that I, the shots that I did were like, were just so different and so much like I so much more crisp and clean and like than what I was trying to accomplish. What, however, what was it? Two years ago. Yeah. And so, yeah, like I, so yeah, that's why I just want, I want to keep making things, whether it's a minute, whether, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah, keep keep, you know, keep finding your voice. I mean, yeah. that's the key. That's the key, and it's it's uh, it's practice for years. Even while I was writing, I never called myself a writer. People would ask me what I did. I said I'm an actor. But you wrote the Superman. Well, I wrote the Superman because it was a vehicle for myself as an actor. For mm-hmm. years, I would just I would I would I would kind of crush myself and say, ah, I'm a yeah, I write, but I'm I'm an actor. And the reality is, is that what I realized is that from all the practice I had from writing stand up and writing and from from acting and doing stand up and all these different things that I became a decent writer and I had to start giving myself credit for being a writer. Did you say that because you weren't confident in your writing abilities or was it something because I I kind of looked up to writers and I remember, you know, seeing certain writers whether it was Aaron Sorkin or or Quentin Tarantino mm-hmm. and hearing their writing and realizing god damn this is so detailed and so rich and 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 I and I just think that I I was always I always handicapped myself a little mm-hmm. bit and said yeah I'm an actor that writes and I write for myself as an actor I write for myself as a vehicle to, to, for myself as an actor and 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 but what I what I what I started to realize is that is that I didn't want to be a staff writer. I didn't want to write for other people, but I was good at writing for myself. So I don't say that anymore. I and when I say anymore in the last eight, ten years. Gotcha. But in the beginning, that's all I, you know, people would be like, So you're a writer? Well, I write for myself as and I always make that excuse and, and uh and I say that because it's 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 practice. Mm-hmm. And the more you practice at anything, I mean if you have a if you have a t- a talent or a pension for it, you will get better. You know, you will get better. I, I, I'm, there's a ton. Look at the Coen brothers. Coen yeah. brothers are directors. Uh, yeah. But they're writers. You know, I don't think in the beginning, if you would have, maybe I'm wrong, but if you would have asked them, I think they would have said they were directors. But they realized in order for them to do what they wanted to do, they were going to have to write their own stuff. And they were smart enough, very, very smart enough to mm-hmm. write their own stuff. Yeah. I just and, heard a story. They were, they were writing Buster Scruggs for like 15 years. Like oh, I believe it. Yeah. I, I loved Buster yeah, Scruggs. It was amazing. Man. It's great. Yeah. The opening man, yeah. that guy coming through town. I, I, I lo- there, there was only one that I didn't love, uh, and that was I think it was the last one on the on the on the cart. Yeah, yeah, it was. It just was. It was a little too much for me. But, yeah. but um, but the um, but the one with Tom Waits. Oh my God, it was unbelievable. Tom Waits is so good. She's so good. And the one in the opening one was great. The one with Franco was good, too. Yeah. And the one with um, uh, the kid, the traveling... Uh, oh, with Liam Neeson. Liam Neeson yeah. was great. They were all great. Yeah. They were all great. The only one that... This the last one was a little bit. Yeah. But yeah, that song in the beginning by the guy that was in Oh, Brother, Where Art Thou? He's so good. What's his name? Uh, is it Tim... It's, yeah, yeah. Something. Oh, yeah. shit. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I just saw him in something else. His buddy, actually, a good friend of his, is... Um, just came out with a film. I saw it in the New Yorker. I can't remember the. I can't remember the name of the film. Oh, he's on Broadway right now in a show, and uh, another guy, like an undiscovered guy, similar to the, the guy, like that guy Tim. I can't remember his last name for the life of me. Tim. Uh, if I can Google it. Yeah, it's. Uh, he was. Uh, oh God, he was so good in that. And I heard some people say that they didn't like the like they were like yeah I liked it except for the opening I'm like what that was the best part <laughs> yeah pretty close if you didn't like the Tom Waits part that was definitely the the, the, the second best thing yeah um, a little slow. um yeah I, I love the Coen Brothers they're they're some of my inspiration for filmmaking just the way Blood Simple. No I oh you got to see Blood okay. Simple that's the first film oh my god that's the first one they did or. 
Blood Simple is is I don't know if they did any shorts before that or anything, but Blood Simple is the, was their breakout film. Yeah, for a while it was okay. on um, with uh, um, oh my god, with Francis McDormand and uh, oh my god, who's the old pain in the ass guy? Who's oh my god, I can't think of his name. My buddy would crush me if I didn't remember <laughs> his name, but. Uh, uh, it's three names and I can't I can't remember it. But the guy who plays like the sheriff, a bad sheriff, and then the guy from Cheers is in it. God, this is the. Um, I want to say Joe Montana, but it's not Joe Montana. This is terrible. This game is not fun. Whatever game, whatever game I'm playing right now is not fun. The uh, who who was it game? Yeah. Oh, this shit's not loading. Um, I need a better computer. Nah, no sweat, no sweat. Well, we'll look it up after. Um. Yeah, but yeah, the, the Coen Brothers. The, I like just the way that they're they're little nuances that they they put into a script. Like I, I w- remember reading, um, it must have been The Big Lebowski, and just like the little details. Like when you hear when you watch it versus when you re- you realize like how precise they are with their dialogue and how they make their characters speak. Like the little like ticks and stutters that a character will do. Like they have it written down. Like they they know exactly what they what they want and what yeah they're they very need. very specific which is like i feel like i don't know that's uh it's obviously something i would like to do but it's very it can come off very forced if it's not done and like because they yeah. the way they do it is so you're just like that's you know it's them and then yeah. you're like, oh you're copying them now. it's m emmett walsh um M. Emmett Walsh is who I was thinking of. Francis okay. McDormand, John Getz, um, and uh, there's let me see, there's one other one too. John Getz, Dan Hedaya as Julian Marty. So, oh, you guys see that film? It's so great, so great. I will add it to the list. I have a ongoing list of hundreds of movies people yeah it's ranked number it's ranked number 98 on afi's 100 years 100 which i think is i think i i mean i would put it in my top definitely my top 30 films of all time without a doubt but you know you're going back 100 years so there's a lot and french you know european films all there's so many there's so many movies i want to get i want to go back and watch movies from like the 50s and 60s Uh, there's just something about that period of cinema that i love just like feel like you lose a lot of that as time goes on just well, everyone's the different uh the different uh tastes of movies you know that, that we're in now we're all like these superhero movies these fast cut fast paced fight movies or there's something that i miss about the old like the slow moving cinematic shots of like of um you know like even like akira kurosawa was one of my favorite directors so um and like even like Frank, Frank Capra, like movies oh, like yeah. that. You know, like ah, I love it. Alfred Hitchcock stuff like that. I love watching those movies. So I'm like, you know, on like a uh, on like a little bit of a, of, of a binge of watching some old old yeah. classics. That's great. Yeah. Uh, w- what is something that inspires you? someone or something that inspires you to keep writing or to keep? Um, like going through your craft and like wanting, wanting to continue to make like just tell stories. Uh, well, I, I, I think I, you know, I, I think it's twofold. You know, I think I think part of it is that um, I'm inspired by a story. You know, mm-hmm. if I'm inspired by an idea, I sit down, I start to write it, and then I start to picture myself, you know, playing one of the characters or mm-hmm. and. Uh, you know, I start to see the world unfold, but, but, um, but I think, you know, I, I've been fortunate in that, you know, I, I, I've, I've been screening my stuff for, for 15 years now and, and, and we've been fortunate in that we've been, um, you know, well received at some places yeah. and, uh, um, and, and, and that, not that that is the, the, the be all end all of, 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 of inspiration for shooting your next thing. But I think if you go and you screen stuff for 10 years mm-hmm. and there's no, especially when you're doing 
comedy or dark comedy and there's no reaction or there's no you know there there there, there there's no you don't have to get awards awards right. are just are, are just uh hardware right but we've been fortunate enough to 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 pull down some awards over the last 10 years and but but i think it's for me it's it's actually screening the projects and seeing mm-hmm. it be well received and um that is sort of the inspiration uh to say I want that. I want. To, I want that feeling again. Yeah. I want to continue to do that, um, and I go back to. I mean, the other stuff. You know, having somebody be there at the right place at the right time, or getting it to the right person, mm-hmm. or you know, I, I've I've been to a, a, a hundreds of meetings. You know, and I've I've had good representation for lit and production and all that stuff, um, but selling selling a fucking project is 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 is, is challenging. Yeah, I bet. You know, it's challenging. But that's why you don't look you don't focus on that. Mm-hmm. You focus on the work. I do believe. I mean, I say it to my friends all the time and they think I'm crazy, but this is my belief and you know, you see anybody that has success with anything that they do, it's always their belief that they followed through with that ends up taking them to the, to, mm-hmm. to their goal. And my belief is that if you if you build it, they will come. If you if you that doesn't mean that you build something in your garage and you just screen it for yourself. It means you build something and you get it in places where you can screen it in front of other people. Right. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I get it. Okay. I get it. Oh, yeah. good. Is there, um, so in wrapping up, is there, I know there's a lot of advice you've given. Is there one piece that you would, you would say like that is your ultimate piece of advice to someone who's, Either where I am, where I'm at, or someone that's wanting to come into Hollywood and and be an actor, be a writer, be a be someone. Well, briefly, I would say, don't wait, create. Mm-hmm. Just do it. Don't wait, mm-hmm. create. Don't wait for anybody. Just get out there and do it. And but a little bit of a of 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 a extended version of that if if. if for someone who is new to LA or new to, to film making, if you mm-hmm. are, if you are in this business because you want to become famous or, uh, anything other than actually caring about the stories that you want to tell, I would say that you're in the wrong business. And I would say that that's an unhealthy approach to being in this business. Yeah. I, 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 you know, Focus on what's right in front of you and what is in your control and you'll be in good shape. You know, and that goes for everything in life. I mean, that goes for every aspect of your life. What's in your control. The second you start looking at what other people are doing or how can this person benefit me or who that, you know, what, what, why is that guy getting this and I'm not getting that? That's when you start to spiral out of control and that's when, you know, you start needing therapy two times a week instead of one time. <laughs> right. Week, you know, exactly. but that's it in a nutshell. Awesome. Um, any anywhere that you want people to find you? I. Uh, well, if are you is this playing this week? This will be next. This will come on Friday. Okay, yeah. so they won't see the festival for Beverly Hills, but we're we're in the Newport Beach Film Festival. Uh, Kensington got in there, and we're excited about that. Cause oh, amazing! I, I hear that's a pretty good film yeah. festival. Um, that is at the end of April through May, and uh, but. If you go on, uh, if you go on uh, Scrappletown. dot com, it's S C R A P P L E T O W N. dot com. Uh, all of my all of my stuff is on there. Perfect. Most of my film film stuff is on there. And then Michael Mark Friedman with a C. Mark is with a C. Is my other website just with my personal Perfect. stuff and my reels and stuff like that. Great. All the links will be below. Um, you guys know where you can find me. Michael, thank you so much for coming on. I, I really do appreciate your time, and uh, I enjoyed our conversation. Awesome, man. Um, you guys know where to find me on Twitter, on on Instagram. Uh, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Thank you guys for joining us today, and I really appreciate, really appreciate it. Uh, and I'll see you next Friday. Cut. <laughs>